Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Subculture. Uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We are a performance and event space, just uh, four days away from celebrating our six-month anniversary of being open. Uh, so again, thank you and, uh, and welcome if you haven't been here before. If you'd like to see what else we have in store, you can visit our website, which is subculturenewyork.com. Uh, on our website, you can see our entire programming calendar, as well as join our email list if you'd like to receive updates with what we have going on here. Uh, and those same updates are available, available on both uh, Facebook and Twitter, where we are both very likable and followable, so please check us out. Thank you. Uh, just two housekeeping things before we begin. Uh, bathrooms are toward the rear of the house behind the bar. The bar will be open for the duration. We just like to stress that we are a listening room and that if you do get up to please be respectful of those around you and respectful to our guests on stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage uh, one of Twitter's uh, media partnerships members and founder of the Twitter Fiction Festival, Andrew Fitzgerald. <laughs> I think that's the first time I've ever been played onto stage. Thank you, guys. Um, wow, this is uh, this is incredible. Look at all of you people. This is amazing. Big round of applause for everyone who came out in the rain in New York City. Um, so I'm Andrew Fitzgerald. I, I uh, work at Twitter. I don't just send tweets. Um, I'm a, a member of uh, Twitter's media team. I work with authors and publishers. Um, and we are really thrilled about the Twitter Fiction Festival this year. Um, so uh, I want to give a big thank you to uh, all of you, uh, not only for coming out in the rain tonight, but for being a part of an event like this. Um, it is, uh, Twitter is about people like you uh, using the platform in amazing ways. Uh, the app mentioned, the hashtag, Twitter fiction itself, these were all innovations that came from Twitter's users. And the Twitter Fiction Festival is meant to be a way to celebrate that experimentation, that creativity, uh, and really a call to arms to drive it even further. What are the other incredible things that Twitter users can come up with? I hope we'll see a lot of it this week. Um, so tonight, here in New York, on Twitter, via live stream, we're going to celebrate this ability for authors to create a live literary tune-in experience, uh, but we're going to do it in person, and I think that's going to be uh, that's going to be an awful lot of fun. Um, at Twitter, we've been really excited to see the uh, experiments around fiction on the platform in the last couple of years. Authors like Teju Cole, uh, Neil Gaiman, Jennifer Egan, even recently uh, Philip Pullman started uh, telling stories on Twitter. We've been really encouraged by these experiments and we wanted to create ways to highlight them even further. And that's where the Twitter Fiction Festival came in. Uh, Twitter is a, a wide open frontier for creative experimentation. It's flexible, it's real time, and it comes with a built-in global audience, potentially of millions of readers. Uh, we think it's an incredible opportunity for authors who want to push the bounds of storytelling and reach readers in new ways. So today, Penguin Random House and the American Association of Publishers, in partnership with Twitter, launched the second ever Twitter Fiction Festival, and you guys, Day one was pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know if you, I don't know who else rushed to work at 9 a.m. to make sure they didn't miss Alexander McCall Smith, but I sure did, and it was awesome. Um, so it's gonna keep going uh, all week, and I encourage everyone here to follow along. TwitterFictionFestival.com is a great place to watch the showcase unfold, or of course the Twitter Fiction hashtag uh, is a great place to watch everyone else who's taking part in the festival from around the world, and take part yourself. Send some tweets, get involved, uh, tell a story, uh, experiment a little. Um, everyone at Twitter is thrilled about what this week has in store, and we cannot wait to see how our users will amaze us over the next five days. So uh, now it's my enormous pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, the author of the upcoming book of essays, The Harm in Asking. Please welcome Sarah Barron. <laughs> Wow. I feel this is the first time that someone has ever gone up on a stage with an iPad and some multicolored note cards. <laughs> My 
think that sort of suggests a lot about the tone of the evening with me as the host, which is kind of like, it's Twitter, but I'm quirky. <laughs> and that's how it's gonna go. Let me do some, uh, some of my professional organizings for you here, which I'm doing with my multicolored note cards. Hi, how are you feeling? No, it's that thing, it's that thing that a host always does. And it's, I do genuinely care how you guys are doing, but also it's kind of like a nervous tick as I settle in to my environment. I am Sarah Barron. I am uh, the host of the evening, as Andrew said. Andrew, thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, normally a woman in my position in this moment, what she does is she looks out into her crowd and she asks them to please turn off their cellular mobile devices. However, this is not the fiction festival. This is the Twitter fiction festival. And um, tonight is not like other nights. Very Passover-y in that way. <laughs> Manish Chana, my people. Hashtag Manish Chana. Hashtag Jews. Um, so anyway, I'm not only not going to tell you to not turn your phones off, I'm gonna ask that you please do keep them on and that you use them actively on Twitter uh, throughout the course of the evening. Now, presumably in this moment, you are thinking to yourself, Sarah, I know we only just met, but I have already assessed that you seem like an insecure and needy woman. And you would be correct in that assumption. And you're thinking, mm, Sarah, if you're insecure and needy, is it gonna be difficult for you to look out into a crowd and see half of the faces buried in a telephone? And the answer is yes, that is difficult for me because I am very insecure and needy. However, upon learning that I was hired for this job, and I use those words loosely, hired and job, because I'm not being paid, but I'm here <laughs> because I support the cause and I needed a reason to get out of the house, frankly. But anyway, so here we are together tonight. I was hired for this job, and when I was, I began an intensive course of cognitive behavioral therapy to prepare for the fact that I would look out at you and a portion of you, I hoped, would have your heads in your phone. So don't worry about me, you guys. <laughs> it's not about me. It's about you. Um, but sort of about me because I'm very needy, but I repress that in a situation like this, and I, I let it be about you. So uh, on that note, we do encourage you to tweet. You are a hip downtown crowd. You can probably figure out on your own what it is that you would like to tweet. However, if you want a little bit of encouragement, this is going to be the moment of my introduction where I let you know what it is that you can do. Now, we have a theme tonight, and that theme is bite-sized. Open to interpretation. It can be bite like like, that's a little thing, and I'm biting it, and I'm eating it now. It can be like that. It can be bite like, I'm something that bites you. It can be like BYTE technology. Loose interpretations, that's what we're after. And because life means nothing without competition, we have paired this theme of ours with a little contest this evening, which is our very short story contest. Here's how it works. I encourage all of you and everyone who is participating online, and there are probably like a million people participating online. So you should feel very special to be here live in the audience with the million people participation that we have going on simultaneously. We encourage all of you to participate in this competition in the following way. You tell us a story in one tweet. You include our hashtag, which is hashtag VSS for very short story, very clever. And also our Twitter handle, which is at TWFictionFest. Now, in truth, we began our competition this morning, so we do already have one winner picked out, and we are going to announce that in the front end of the show, and then we will pick a second and a third winner throughout the course of the evening to give, give us a little tension. You know what I mean? To kind of like keep it fun, keep it exciting. Right now, those of you who are looking at your phones, it doesn't make me insecure because of the cognitive behavioral therapy that I have done in the last month since being hired for the job that I'm not paid for. So. You might be also wondering, what do I win? Here's what you win. You win the moment of us announcing that you've won, where it's like, oh my God, your name, you beat out other people, you competed, you're clever, you're awesome, and you're gonna feel kind of awesome about it tomorrow. Also, then you'll probably get some Twitter followers, which is never a bad thing, and most importantly, you will receive a poster which I know sounds kind of lame, but it's actually very awesome. It's a Twitter Fiction Festival 2014 poster from Litograph, wordplay, which you will walk out of here uh, with this evening and, and then you'll like put it on your wall in your apartment and then someone will come over and be like, I'm in the books, and they'll be like, me too, and then you'll have sex and it'll be awesome. So, 
Uh, you'll be like, David Foster Wallace is my favorite author too. Oh my God, we're meant to be together. Like that's how it'll go if you win a poster. So I suggest that you compete in our little competition. Um, one of my rules as a host is that I would never dream of asking my audience to do something that I would not do myself. So to get us in the mood, in the rhythm, on the topic of our hashtag VSS, Very Short Story Festival, I have prepared one minute's worth of very short stories of my own. So I'm going to read those for you. After that, we will announce our very first winner. After that, we will bring our first performer to the stage. How does that strike you guys in terms of itinerary? Yeah. It's what I call a good itin. Hashtag it. Manish Tana. All right. One minute's worth of my own very short stories. A Democrat married a Republican. They said they challenged each other, but really, they just compromised. She realized that, in fact, 21 was not forever on the day she wore a half shirt. <laughs> a gal who's always late arrives late. She says, so sorry to her friend who says, that's okay, but thinks, my God, I really hate you. <laughs> a man says, I love funny women, to a woman who says back, that just means that you hope that I'll laugh at your jokes. <laughs> Going dark, people, deal with it. We're underground at subculture. <laughs> Hashtag truth. She gave birth, then exercised obsessively to lose her baby weight. She hoped to teach her kid that nothing's more important than mommy being thin. A man is old. He dates a woman who is less old. Sarah Barron is surprised. <laughs> I go to a bra store. I get measured. I am measured a 38A. My wide rib cage shakes as I cry. <laughs> Now, as you can tell, those were not like, and this is how it's done. This is like, you guys, the host just humiliated herself, so surely I have shown you that you can do a much better job than I did. On that theme, are you ready to hear our very first winner of the VSS Festival? Okay. I don't know if it like goes up and then I, do I say it and then it goes up or like, what's the, what's the most tension building rhythm? Okay, I'm gonna make a decision. The winner, our first winner is a young woman by the name of Sarah Dooley. She may or may not be here right now. Her Twitter handle is at Unruly Dooley, which is very funny. And her tweet is as follows. Can it just a little bit louder, if you wouldn't mind? Just a little <laughs> louder. Sarah Dooley's first winning tweet. I never said I was good at the Heimlich. I said I was familiar, she said. The job interview was off to a rocky start. Round of applause for Sarah Dooley, ladies and gentlemen. Very clever. And now, without further ado, our first performer this evening is a gentleman by the name of James Brawley. James is a writer, performer, and contributor to This American Life, The New York Times, and The Moth, where he is a two-time Grand Slam champion, which I don't know if you guys know about The Moth, but that is not an easy thing to do. His latest off-Broadway monologue, Life in a Marital Institution, recently completed a 14-city tour produced by Meredith Vieira Productions. Who knew that existed, but go her. I want also to say that I know James personally, and as someone who doesn't do a great job separating the art from the artist, like I need my artists to be decent people, James is a very kind and decent man, which I think is important. Anyway, here to perform an original story from his new show in progress, The Nun Monthly Nut. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, James Brawley. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Twitter. So, and hello to you. I'm sitting at my desk in my office in my apartment building on Central Park West, a few floors down from my apartment in a storage unit. Right there are uh, cinder blocks on the side, pipes kind of like here running along the ceiling, a uh, service elevator in the back and in the front, a window, a little window looking out on the street. It's a luxury storage unit. Uh, working late as usual on something I hate as usual. Uh, try not to think about it because if I start thinking, I will stop working and then I'll stop earning and then I'll lose my apartment and then 
I will lose my mind because I am my apartment. When through the window, I see an ambulance, fire trucks, and police cars, the disaster trifecta. Someone's injured in a compromised location as a result of criminal activity. And soon the stairs outside my, my uh, storage unit uh, door, uh, I'm one flight up from the, from the uh, street level, fill with emergency workers screaming through walkie-talkies. And I follow them up and around the corner and down the hall as they go towards the apartment where my neighbor Bob used to live before his wife slapped him with a restraining order, which had set me to wondering, where did Bob go? Where 10 or 15 emergency workers are now rushing in. I first met Bob in the interview room of my co-op. I was on the board of directors, newly elected by a plurality of my neighbors, my winning platform being, I am a people person. Someone with the judgment to separate the good people who wanted to move into our building and buy apartments from the bad people who wanted to move into our building and buy apartments. For example, Bob a freelance videographer with no visible means of support uh, versus his brand new wife, an Emmy award-winning news producer, both of whom are sitting side by side on a couch facing me with a glass coffee table between us, on top of which is a, a telephone book-sized purchase application package, right? reams of personal and business references, which I don't read because I had friends write those same things for me when I moved in, and uh, a bunch of financial documents, which I don't really understand because I'm a people person. So uh, I'm trying to look past the documents into their peopleness to see who are they. And as I look in Bob's wife's eyes, I see, I want an Emmy. Screw you. Versus what I'm seeing in Bob's eyes. I am screwed. I didn't win an Emmy. I don't even have a job. I don't deserve her, don't deserve this. I'm a fraud. So I vote to let him in, <laughs> because I don't deserve this either. I just happen to buy low, and I have an unbelievable tolerance to stay in a storage unit 18 hours a day, working at a job I hate to fund an apartment that I love. I love my lifestyle, but I hate my life. Misery loves company, welcome to the building. <laughs> and uh, a few months later, I'm in my storage unit, working, when uh, the phone rings. It's Bob's wife saying, I need to talk to you right now. Can you meet me on 81st and Broadway, on the traffic median, between the uptown and the downtown sides, so it'll look like uh, we just ran into each other in case Bob is watching us? Now, I have a very troubled marriage, and I love weird situations. <laughs> and I hate working in my storage unit, so I'm over there standing on the median before she gets there. And uh, she walks up and says, Bob kidnapped our daughter. And when I find him, I'm going to divorce him, which is why I called you, James. I, uh, I know that Bob is bisexual, which uh, I'd accepted. And since you're his special friend, I was wondering if you could tell me where he is. Special friend? Well, there's nothing wrong with it, James. I am not his special friend. I barely even know him. Right, the only social experiences we've had together are uh, a baby CPR class in their apartment when he took the little baby dummy and said, it's having a heart attack, and smashed it into the wall to revive it, thinking that was funny. And then another time we had drinks on our roof, my drinks, because he doesn't have any money, uh, which is when he told me he had admitted himself into Bellevue, the psych unit, twice for inappropriate violent impulses which we all have, I say to his wife, but apart from that, I don't even know the guy. Well, she says, do you know that Ed is Bob's sponsor at AA? Ed being the former superintendent in our building, uh, who was recently fired by the board of directors, including me, for his inappropriate violent impulses. He threatened to kill us. I say, well, you know, I know that I'm supposed to be a people person, but I don't really know Ed or Bob because I spend 18 hours a day in a storage unit. Well, says Bob's wife, like an Emmy award-winning news producer, Ed used to be a sniper in Vietnam. And he's got a house in New Jersey with a basement full of sniper rifles. I think Bob is living there. Do you think Bob would use a sniper rifle, James? And that's when I take Bob's wife by the elbow and I lead her across the street, deep into the cheese department of Zabar's. <laughs> Putting her back to the plate glass window in a giant wheel of Jarlsberg between us, 
which I'd watched on the TV documentary, is dense enough to stop a bullet. Because I still got my kids. She says, I've spent all my time developing my career, James. I never developed my people sense. Do you have any advice? Like me, the people person, who spends 18 hours a day in a storage unit and is the only person in the building to befriend her violent, kidnapping, bisexual husband. I say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the side entrance until the cops find Bob in case he's hiding behind a tree in Central Park with a sniper rifle pointing at our front door. And uh, in the meantime, I think you and I should walk home separately. So I do, and as I walk in the side door, out walks the other Bob who lives in our building, upstairs Bob. All right, he's on the 10th floor with the movie stars on his way to a Another weekend at his upstate horse farm with a big smile on his face. He's a merry mogul. A few months after that, I'm in my office late at night, working, alone, late, when the ambulance and the fire trucks and the police cars pull up and the emergency workers rush up the stairs and I follow them around the corner and down the hall as from the other end of the hall, another line of emergency workers run into the apartment followed by another member of the board of directors, a doctor who looks stricken. I say, what happened? He says, Bob jumped, which is good news, right? Because suicide's better than murder unless he killed her first. I say, what about his wife? He says, not Bob, Bob. Upstairs, Bob, the merry mogul with the upstate horse farm and the awesome apartment on the 10th floor, which evidently he's just jumped out of. And uh, I'd love to stay in chat, but I'm on a deadline. I'm uh, writing a motivational speech for a pharmaceutical executive who's launching this new anti-psychotic wonder drug. It's called Suppressol and it suppresses homicidal and suicidal impulses. Right? Upstairs Bob and downstairs Bob in the same drug. Right? I got bills to pay. So it's two or three o'clock in the morning at this point, and uh, the only light is uh, from my desk lamp and a uh, little uh, street lamp outside my, my window, which shines along the ceiling on the pipes to the back, where I feel something. And I turn around and I see my uh, bell-shaped lamp and silhouette and an armoire and some other objects, and then standing amidst them, Bob, upstairs Bob, who just jumped out of his window and is therefore now lying in the courtyard, dead, meaning there is now in my office a ghost, which where I come from is one ghost too many. So I run out of my office and up seven flights of stairs because ghosts can't run. And just in case they can, I run into my apartment and lock the door because ghosts can't get through locks. But just in case they can, I run into my boy's bedroom, six and three years old, and into their bed between them, and I grab them uh, and hold them like shields because ghosts are afraid of boys. And just in case they aren't, I say out loud, I'm sorry, Bob. Rest in peace. And then I sniff my boy's hair. They smell like vanilla pudding, like Boston cream pie, which is my birthday cake since I was their age, when I believed that I could be anything, a president, a quarterback, something I really believed in. And I say out loud, please, God, please don't let my boys grow up to be like me. A few days later, I see a, a clipboard on the front desk. There's a death notice. Upstairs, Bob was depressed at work. A few weeks after that, there's a feature on the evening news produced by Downstairs Bob's Emmy Award winning wife. Downstairs Bob has been arrested in Kabul where he's on trial for kidnapping Afghanis, bringing them back to his apartment, putting them in a makeshift jail and torturing them until they admit that they're terrorists. His defense is that he was just the cameraman for a rogue CIA agent operating with the full knowledge of the American government. Either way, it's good news because he finally found a job. <laughs> a few weeks after that, I signed the contract of sale on my apartment on my birthday as a birthday present to myself. I figure, having spent many years loving my lifestyle, the biggest gift I can give to myself is loving my life. Thank you. <laughs>
like one more thing and I was gonna time a hip, not, I mean, this is not critical. You guys are amazing. Do you know what? Oh, Jesus. She's loosening it up, ladies and gentlemen, loosening up. Let's talk for a second about how awesome James was. Was that a good story? Was that a good story? Yes, I find him very, um, very soothing. Very entertaining, but also very soothing. And if that head of hair, oh my God. It's like, it's like Falcor and I wanna be the Atreyu on that head of hair. Also, if I had hair like that, which I don't, I would just go like this all day. But I'm one of those women who has like less hair than most men, it's super depressing. Can I say a thing? So, you're busy, okay. Gentlemen, gentlemen, do you feel that, uh, I'm trying to be one of those people who like effortlessly moves the microphone around and it's going awesome, hashtag awesome. Um, do you feel that at some point tonight I could do something with the piano that could sort of evoke Fabulous Baker Boys? Yes. Awesome. I've never felt less desirable in my entire life. <laughs> that was depressing. I was like, I'll try it on for size, and I'll be like, yeah, and then I'll be like, great, and then I'll sing, and then I'll be on the piano, and they were like, um, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> I can take a hint. I can. Um, you look a little like that guy in um, um, the Hello Ladies thing. Do you know what I mean? Have you watched that show? He's extremely successful and incredibly talented, and I think very cute, and I'm married, but I'm just saying, like, I think it's like totally a compliment. Okay. You guys ready for our next performer? Woo! Hashtag thought so. All right. Um, the gentleman coming to the stage next is Matt Gehring. Matt is a writer performer often featured at the Upright Citizens Brigade, People's Improv Theater, and Magnet Comedy Stages here in New York. He has appeared on the Louis C.K. show, Louis and performed, I find, I'm just saying, Matt, if you're listening, I know you are. This next part is my favorite part of your whole bio. He's performed charades with Jennifer Aniston, who, P.S., recently watched Were the Millers on a flight. Very underrated performance for Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> He's performed charades with Jennifer Aniston on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, here to perform a handful of sketches from his social media sketch program, The Tweet Show. Please give a warm round of applause to Matt Gehring. Striking out with the ladies at the bar, yeah, I used to be just like you, bro -sif. Until I learned the secret, you see, I was walking my dog at the dog park, and that's when it just clicked. All women want is animal magnetism. It's true. See that bitty over there at the bar? Watch this. Watch this. Here's my number. Call me. Thank you for your number. See? What's going on? Yeah, it's your boy DJ Trey. Yeah, y'all want to thank y'all for coming out to my album release party. Yeah, yo, I'm about to give you some new tracks of my new tunes. Yo, I'm gonna give you samples. Yo, let's do track one. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I miss my mom. <laughs> Every day. Yeah, yo, that's my new tune. It's called I Miss My Mom Every Day. Yeah, I was in a weird place when I wrote it. That's cool, that's cool. Yeah, yo, I'm about to give you track two right now. It's called Sun, Sun. Yo, DJ, spin it. Here we go. All right. Mr. Sun, Sun, Mr. Golden Sun, please shine down on me. Yeah. Yeah, that track was hot because it's about the sun learning. Yo, yeah. Yo, I'm about to give you track Trey right now, and you might recognize it. It's a ro 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 remix. Oh, McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. And on that farm, he had a 
cow. Yeah, cow. Yeah. E-I-E-I-O with a here, there, here, there, everywhere. Yeah, she got it all right. Yo, if it's not clear, I don't want to be a rapper no more. I want to be a kindergarten teacher. D -d -d Drop the mic. <laughs> And now Matthew McConaughey as Jack in a high school production of The Importance of Being Earnest. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is rapidly dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But... Though she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. My dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me What's by that? Mama with unpleasing <laughs> comments, has like naturally stirred the like deeper fibers of my nature. What are you doing like your that? Christian name is an irresistible <laughs> fascination. Would you like hanging? The simplicity oh, really? of your okay. character okay. makes you exquisitely yeah, yeah. Like comprehensible like, to me. Okay. Like your town address at the Albany I have. Like what is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. All right, all right, all right. Hey, hi. I've never been to this uh, Target before. I was just wondering, do you guys have a, uh, a whitening pen? Uh, a whitening pen? Uh, a whitening pen? Oh, uh, a whitening pen? What is it? Uh, it's like a pen that uh, uh, whitens. It's uh, a whitening pen. Let me ask my uh, Mark. No, you don't have to ask me. Hi, Mark. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering if you guys had a, uh, a whitening pen? A whitening pen? A whitening pen? It's like a pen that whitens. It's a whitening pen? I am thinking of no other words other than that. Uh, it's like if my shirt were white and got soiled or dirty, I would use this pen to whiten. It's a whitening uh, pen? Yeah, I don't know. L let me go ask our manager. No, you guys. Come on. Mark! Mark! <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> they don't even know what a whitening pen is. A whitening pen? Alright, Sarah, I know I don't get much right. But you, but you, <laughs> but you, <clears throat> but you, <clears throat> not gonna cry. I am not gonna cry. <clears throat> but you, you changed my life, life, you changed my life. Would Muhammad Ali cry? No. Would Rambo cry? No. Would Indiana Jones cry? No. Am I gonna cry? Hell no. You changed my life. And I just want you to know that, uh, I just want you to know that, uh, get back in there. Get back. It's only crying if it comes out, everybody. I just want you to know that. I love you. I love you so much. It hurts. Why would, why, why would you leave me? Why would you do that to me? I have hurt. No. No, stop. I want everyone just in the party stop. to hear. I'll take you back. Oh, you take me back? Cool, 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 cool. Yo, Tony. Yo, she'll take me back. No, no, I didn't cry. No, no. Fuck that. <laughs> Elizabeth, look, 
I know I'm just a simple Irish singer-songwriter who showed up at your doorstep but a mere three weeks ago to share what has arguably been the greatest love story ever seen under the stars and moon. But I wanted to tell you something, and uh, I wanted to do it in song. Uh, so I wrote it with my invisible guitar right here. That plays by itself. <laughs> I'm breaking up with you, sorry. <laughs> Hey, trombone, what's the matter? Not feeling so hot? Well, I mean, trombone, have you ever thought about going to therapy? Whoa, trombone, calm down. <laughs> therapy is not for crazy people. I mean, I go to therapy. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> therapy is for anyone and everyone who just needs someone to talk to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At therapy, you can turn into ad therapy. <laughs> but I really want to get this because I'm a frustrated musical theater performer at heart. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that. <laughs> Ma'am, no one else is. You're like probably my age and Jewish and like you've dated a lot and you're connecting to me emotionally. That's what's going on a little bit. Cool glasses, great head of hair. Oh God, I loved that last bit. I found, normally when someone takes a musical instrument up on stage but in a comedy way, I'm like, this is going to suck and be lame. And I feel like, Matt, that was one of the great... Uh, musical comedy moments of my life. Okay, are you guys ready? Slash kind of like seeing the uh, cartoon Up. Do you feel that? It was like, this is like Up. And he's like the little boy and he's the trombone is the old man and it was so clever and moving. Um, are you guys ready for our second very short story competition winner? Yeah. I know, me too. All right. Oh, shoot. A thing's happening with, okay, I fixed it. Professionalism. <laughs> Here is, I just heard someone in the audience go, professionalism. <laughs> Which means she either found what I said quite funny or she was like, this girl needs to pull it together. <laughs> but I'm keeping it loose. I'm like keeping Twitter accessible, which is kind of like what I offer as a host. Okay, our second winning tweet is from Confetti Fall, at Confetti Fall, we smuggled deep web links into China using QR code temporary tattoos until vacation selfies gave us away. <laughs> Applaud, that's very clever. <laughs> Blue Barrio, you're, you just got that bit of, of, of winning and also a poster from Lithograph. All right, can I leave this, this up here? Bring it back, okay, great. Do you know what I know how to do? Take a note. Take a note. Okay. Our next, uh, our next performer for this evening is a young woman by the name of Diana Speckler. She is the author of two books, and I don't mean like uh, lame books. I'm talking this woman has written two novels, okay? One is called Who By Fire, the other is called Skinny. She has written for many different publications, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Times, GQ. She is a six time moth story slam champion. And this part I am going to read from my card. Um, she's reading an original piece, and I love this title, the author bios of Pamela Meeks. Very clever, Diana. She is in collaboration with our musical director, 
Cody Owen Stein. She is also the woman my husband refers to as my favorite of your friends. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Diana Speckler. <laughs> The author bios of Pamela Meeks. In case Pamela Meeks one day needs an author bio. One, Pamela Meeks received her MFA degree in creative writing last year from an MFA degree granting university. She lives in Brooklyn with her two adorable baby ferrets, <laughs> Molly and Leopold, who give her all the love she'll ever need. With that said, a few nights ago at a bar called Garbage, Meeks met the blue-eyed, slightly waifish Victor Cassidy, a fiction writer, photographer, and fellow MFA graduate who started his own publishing house called Real. In a Bushwick basement because, quote, no work of high literary quality has emerged from this country in a hundred years, end quote. As they spoke, as Victor Cassidy danced his puppet master eyes around Meeks's face, she thought, he understands what's special about me. And simultaneously understood that every woman he'd ever met had thought, he understands what's special about me. The following morning, Meeks woke feeling sexy and anxious. She ate a burrito and online purchased a bra. <laughs> Victor Cassidy texted her a photograph of his fingers with a message that, quote, most people discard photographs in which fingers block the image, but my fingers are subjects, not obstructions, end quote. His artistic goals, Victor Cassidy explained, included redefining finger pictures. Meeks replied, a much welcomed respite from dick pics as if she were a constant dick pic recipient. <laughs> Pamela Meeks, let it be known, is capable of loving a flawed man, but more importantly, at work on her first novel. Tentative title, A Love Story. Two. Pamela Meeks received her MFA degree in creative writing two years ago from an MFA degree granting university. You may refrain from asking Meeks to name the MFA degree granting university and from asking what kind of music she listens to or if she's ever had a real relationship because those are not questions, those are judgments. <laughs> you may also quit sneering at her upper arms like she should start doing Pilates unless she plans to become her mother who is of chronic poor health both physically and existentially. Maybe Meeks checks the mirror too much. She blames Victor Cassidy, who has committed parts of the Canterbury Tales to memory and parlays his recitations into sex with young women who wear the same glasses he wears. Pamela Meeks does not wear glasses. Her vision is 2020, and plastic gives her hives, even that nylon-based plastic that's supposedly hypoallergenic. Meeks would like to divest you of your ignorant notion that two years is ample time to finish a novel. Two years may as well be two seconds if the novelist has a full-time job, such as editorial assistant to Victor Cassidy, responsibilities of which include maintaining reels Instagram feed by posting flattering sepia-toned photos of Victor Cassidy hard at work with a pencil between his teeth like a rose. Meeks should not share her fragile novel in progress with Victor Cassidy, but Meeks wants to prove that she's a novelist and not a person who forever claims to be writing a novel. She wants Victor Cassidy to say, your talent is boundless, Pamela because she thrives on validation, a maladjustment born of her mother's personality disorder. Meeks is leaving her therapist. Three, 
Three years after receiving her MFA degree in creative writing from an MFA degree granting university, Pamela Meeks burst onto the literary scene. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Pamela Meeks's mother is dying. Meeks doesn't want to talk about it. She's not even sure it's true because for one thing, her mother's medicine cabinet has always housed a throng of orange pill bottles and for another, her mother has claimed imminent mortality before. Long ago, when Meeks gave her mother the silent treatment for reading Meeks's journal, Meeks's mother said, you should talk to me because soon I'll be gone. She claimed to be dying again when Meeks went away to college. Go live your life. Mine's almost over. Last time she was home, Meeks told her mother, your hair looks pretty. And her mother replied, I don't have hair anymore. And then changed the subject, leaving Meeks to spend the rest of the weekend staring at her mother's hair, wondering if it was a wig. Victor Cassidy never said he hated Meeks's novel, A Love Story. What he said was that he, quote, can't get it up for female authored novels that probe matters of the heart, end quote. Meeks is taking a break from novel writing to get her shit together. She knows that sounds vague and thereby unwriterly, but copping to her vagueness attests to her razor-sharp self-awareness and dark, sophisticated wit. Meeks's ferrets, Molly and Leopold, do not get along, mostly because Leopold is an asshole. <laughs> Four. Pamela Meeks received her MFA degree in creative writing four years ago. She's writing a new author bio because her last one included the cliches, get her shit together, and razor sharp, and she feels ashamed. <laughs> to be fair, the bio also included fresh concepts like asshole ferrets. Meeks is working on becoming a lesbian. Five. Pamela Meeks received her MFA degree in creative writing four years and two months ago. She doesn't understand how this happened. She already has white hair like George Washington and has to use L'Oreal Root Touch-Up every 14 days, though the product in no way restores her 32-year-old hair to its 22-year-old color and sheen. With her roots copper and the rest too dark, she looks like a penny that's been stuck be behind a couch cushion since Valley Forge. Meeks understands that her penny slash Valley Forge analogy is anachronistic. Meeks has neither finished her novel nor started a new one. She still works in a windowless basement for a man who will not only never love her, but who now exclusively dates Korean women aged 19 to 24. Meeks's mother continues to live in Connecticut. Pamela Meeks needs to spend more time in Connecticut. Victor Cassidy calls Connecticut big-haired, bougie bumblefuck. Over the phone, Meeks' mother says, just know how much I love you, in a tone that fills Meeks with a deep guilt-despair blend that often precedes delivery from Roberta's of a $16 good girl pizza. Pork sausage, telegio, garlic, kale, possibly heroin. The name Good Girl Pizza causes Meeks to study her arm fat while whispering, kale is a superfood. <laughs> Victor Cassidy thrives in Bushwick where he's found easy success with both his publishing company and his finger photos, the latter of which hang in hotels all over Brooklyn and allegedly Portland. <laughs> He is seeking representation for his short story collection, The Whole World is Mine. Six. Pamela Meeks received her MFA degree in creative writing, let's say within the last five years. This morning, Meeks rose from her bed on wheels. She dreams of a life free of wheels that take her nowhere to once again ride the L train to her job in that goddamn basement. Before she made her coffee, Meeks found her ferret, Leopold, 
the judgmental one, strutting around the warped hardwood of her living room, his back a royal hump, and her other ferret, Molly, lying on the windowsill. Even though ferrets look dead when they sleep, Meeks knew immediately that Molly was gone. She sat beside Molly and watched her for a long time, willing a rise and fall of breath. Through the window, a black fire escape zigzagged the bricks of the neighboring apartment building as if it couldn't pick a direction. Meeks touched Molly's tiny pink nose and found it dry and hard. And yet, Molly looked so much the way she'd always looked, soft and gray and kind. Seven, Pamela Meeks does not wish to corroborate universal assumptions about single 30-something Brooklyn women. But she is seeing a Reiki master for energy healing and that shit is the bomb diggity. <laughs> Meeks wonders whether bomb diggity is one word or two, and assuming it's one, when exactly it became obsolete. She considers using it ironically to resurrect it. Yesterday, Meeks mentioned the idea to Victor Cassidy, who looked at her over his computer monitor and smiled and said that bomb diggity was definitely the name of his buddy's internet marketing firm. He said, nevertheless, Pamela Meeks, you are the bomb diggity. To which Meeks replied, I confess that no evidence exists to the contrary. And they kept smiling at each other the way they hadn't in years. And Meeks wondered if she'd deprived herself of his smiles by never looking at him. She'd always worried that if she looked right at him, she would see in his eyes indifferent smudged pains. But his eyes were clear blue airplane window sky. And she almost, almost said, I love you, Victor Cassidy. Eight, days after her mother's death, pills, accidental. The doctor, grandmotherly in his translucent scrub cap said, definitely accidental. During a particularly intense Reiki session, Pamela Meeks revisited a long ago 4th of July, standing in the backyard of her childhood home, sweeping a sparkler from one side of her body over her head to the other side, creating a bright orange arc. Meeks's mother, who still wore short shorts and a bandana over her hair, who was still a nucleus for all the world's men, warned Meeks to be careful, stand still, she said, you're holding fire, stand still. Nine, Pamela Meeks is a writer. Due to the inevitable follow-up question, what have you written? She's never claimed the title before, but now she's quit her editorial assistant job to honor herself and her talents. Victor Cassidy can suck the diseased milkshake straw between his legs that's probably shriveled from years of skinny jean squeeze. <laughs> Pamela Meeks doesn't mean that. Meeks is spiritual now and loves everyone, even those who can't love her back. It's just that it's time to move on, to stop standing still. That sparkler burns out so quickly. 10. Pamela Meeks received her MFA degree in creative writing from an MFA degree granting university. She lives in Brooklyn with her ferret, Leopold, who has grown very attached to her since Molly the ferret's death. Leopold seems to be grieving, though he badly mistreated Molly and possibly killed her. Meeks is at work on a memoir, tentatively titled, the whole world is one, how Reiki rescued me. Her unfinished novel, A Love Story, was a wall that stood for years between her soul and her authentic self. Thank you. of the
the emotional roller coaster that Diana Speckler just put me on. My God. <laughs> Laughing, melancholy, oi. Manish Tana. Um, here's what I want to do now. I want to read another entry in our VSS competition. Um, it's not one of the winners because it can't be a winner because it was submitted by one of our one of our crew, as it were, and that would be nepotistic. So we're not going to do that. But it's like a fun little filler because it made me laugh. I thought maybe I would share it. Anyway, is that cool? Now, I'm going to take the mic out of the stand. And the last time I did this, I didn't do a great job putting it back in. And then the sound guy, who has a name, which I should use, but I haven't been formally introduced, so I don't mean to derogatorily be like the sound guy because he's important. But he instructed me on how to put it back the right way. I don't feel I fully absorbed that. So, sir, wherever you are, I'm going to take it out. And when I put it back in, it might not go great. <laughs> You're my number one fan. Number one fan, connecting. Okay. <laughs> this tweet, can I stand here lighting wise? Great, <laughs> thank you. It's just because I'm so vulnerable, isn't it? It's like, so what's she gonna do next? I'm gonna read a tweet. This is an entry, not a winner, just an entry in our very short story competition. And it was written by a certain gentleman named Cody Owenstein. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what I want to do is sort of walk toward you seductively while you play on the piano and I read your own words to you. <laughs> but I feel that that will ruin the comedy of the tweet that you wrote, so I'm just going to read it. And I'm letting you know that that was my impulse. Ready? They're called jorgings, sort of a cross between jorts and jeggings. I made them myself. Wait, come back. Cody Owenstein, ladies and gentlemen. Not just a pianist, but also a comedian. How was that? Yeah, I thought that went well. Okay, are you guys ready for our next act? I do believe that you are. This group is, um, there's in a way very little to say about them. They have just a, a lot of innovative, big, fat talent. That is what they're working with. They come to us tonight all the way from the former ninth planet of the solar system, the official ambassadorial delegation Pluto. <laughs> We are from Pluto, and we are very excited to be here. We are full of boundless enthusiasms for your feral musics and your tall architecture. Some of you may be following us on Twitter at Delegation Pluto. Although, statistically speaking, this is an improbability. We are the official ambassadorial delegation for the Ninth Planet, and we are here to discuss a matter of pressing concern for both of our beautiful worlds. I am talking about everyone's favorite icy rock, Pluto. Pluto is a planet. This is the first thing we want to say, and really if it's the only thing you take away tonight, we're fine with that. Pluto is a planet. Now unfortunately, but also reversibly, a few Earth friends have stopped calling it one. And what we want to talk about is why that's a problem for us and for you. So, how did we get here? Well, we got in our chrono-temporal displacement transport and we slung shot Jupiter's gravity just so. It took us about seven, no, I, I'm kidding. What I actually am asking very seriously is how we got to this sad state of Pluto not a planetness. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mike Brown. Mike Brown is a gentleman of much knowledge. He can run three athlons in a single day. He has a little daughter. He enjoys pop-based guitar musics. I enjoy the sideways parting of his head hairs. Unfortunately, he is also a troublemaker. A few years ago, Mike Brown discovered this, Eris, there in the upper right-hand corner as you see it. Eris is a celestial body. We call it a planet because it kind of looks like one, right? It's in our neighborhood. But for some reason, Earth friend Mike Brown did not want to be the discoverer of another planet. 
And that's his actual handle. We did not make that up. <laughs> so Earth friend Mike Brown took his findings to the International Astronomical Union and combined with the discovery of a few other big-ish cosmic entities in our neck of the woods, which you call the Kuiper Belt and we call the Home Ring, led to an act of mass hysteria on September 13th, 2006, Earth Friends. The International Astronomical Union recklessly redefined a planet as a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun. Is, words, words, it's round. It has to be round, basically. It's a planet and has cleared the neighborhood of its orbit. Cleared the neighborhood. Earth friends, what, what does this even mean? What does this mean? This third parameter is the problem, and we will be returning to it. Some Earth astronomers fought bravely, but as a result of this sad state, many Earth astronomers no longer refer to Pluto as a planet. Pluto is now a dwarf planet, but it's also a trans-Neptunian object, and it is also an ice dwarf, and it is also, and this gets us right in our metaphorical hearts, we don't actually have hearts, a plutoid. Earth friends, this situation is a travesty of unclarity. Let us show you the nomenclatural thicket into which your IAU has dragged all of you, unbeknownst to yourselves. Take a look at this. There's the planets there in the upper left, there on their own. We've selected four for you. Earth, Mars, Jupiter. Gosh, Jupiter is, is very beautiful. Neptune. Let's move on. Let's look at Charon. Charon is our moon. Now, it's a satellite, but it's also a trans-Neptunian object. Now, let's look at Ceres. Now, Ceres is the largest object in your asteroid belt. This means that Ceres is a minor planet, a dwarf planet, and an asteroid. And finally, we have Pluto and Eris. Minor planet, dwarf planet, trans-Neptunian object, and Plutoid. Earth friends, this is all because we have not cleared our neighborhood. What kind of system is this for defining things which are supposed to be defined by their innate characteristics? If you took the Earth and you put it in the Kuiper Belt, which is lovely, by the way, it is lovely, the Earth would no longer be a planet. If you took Pluto and you put it in Earth's rotation, presto, planet. Earth friends, if you took your cat and you put it in a pizzeria, it would still be a cat whether or not it had cleared the neighborhood of mice. If you took your mother and you put her in Greenland, she would still be your mother. We do not have parents per se, but we understand that these concepts are very durable for you. Earth friends, we are very upset about this, but we are upset because of the kinship that we feel with you. The sense of share, um, the sh uh, this, is, this, this, this is probably the, from another deck. That was probably a different deck. There's. There's a lot of jokesters at the Plutovian embassy, and just just scroll. Can you skip it? I I can't. Just scroll can't. past it very quickly. I should just scroll past it. It's just. Are you sure? Uh, yep. It's definitely not any sort of Plan B, Earth friends. Um, <laughs> the point. The point is that we share so much, and we'd like to tell you a little bit about ourselves and all the things that we share. Both Pluto and Earth are not gas giants. Both Pluto and Earth have atmospheres, more or less. Ours is a little finicky, but we sort of have one most of the time. Both Pluto and Earth co-orbit with thousands, and how's this for not clearing your neighborhood? It's you guys too, people. Thousands of other celestial objects. And both Pluto and Earth have big, beautiful moons. And we'd like to tell you a little bit about those moons. The first moon, when we, um, the, the, I think we have a moon slide with a lot of data on the moons. Yes. There, uh, there isn't a lot of data on this slide. This is the moon slide. It's, it's the slide to tell them about the moon. Okay, great, 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 great. Uh, it's, it's a little different than the... Um, so Pluto has five moons. Charon, Nix... We were born Charon side, which is the side of Pluto that faces our largest moon, which is called Charon. That's true. It's, frankly, Earth friends, it's the less desirable hemisphere. Yes, but it is the most beautiful. We see the best eclipses when Charon and Pluto and the sun scissorgy. That's true. Um, we were both born Charon side. Yes, we were. Uh, and moving, moving forward, another point of similarity is recreation. 
Uh, Plutovians don't play sports per se because we are actually instantiated as temperature differentials between different forms of atmospheric methane, but we do have a game we like to play, which we'd like to tell you about, called nitrogen fixing. The the, uh, this is not, I think, the nitrogen fixing slide, Junior Delegate. This is the slide. Um, I'm sorry, Earth friends. We're clearly it's having. It's the slide that we are showing now. Technical difficulty. It is very nice on Pluto. I think it is possible that you are not aware of and that. And we would like to tell our Earth friends about. It's it's cold, but it is nice. You could visit. You would not explode. I'm. <laughs> Earth friends, I'm sorry. We've, frankly, we've had a very, very hard week. We get satellite TV sometimes if the solar wind is right. We, we were going to Paris to talk to the International Astronomical Union about this, and there was a border misunderstanding, and we were incarcerated for a few days. It's like been you, confusing. You can't get HBO or anything like that, but you could watch The Office. I have seen many episodes of The Office. Sometimes the reception is not very good. For a long time, I thought that Pam was a hydrogen cloud. I have seen every single one of seasons one and two of Earth Entertainment Mad Men. I have not seen it technically, since technically we do not have eyes, but they say it's all about the atmosphere with that show anyway. <laughs> On Earth, when you notice something, you say, there is. Like, there is a school bus, or there is the mountain of Everest. On Pluto, we say, expithipikassen, and that literally means wave. So we say, wave to the school bus, or wave to the mountain of Everest, or expithipikassen citra, which means wave to Earth. And if there are children present, children is the wrong word, but the translation engine says children, it is like an instruction. Expithipikassen citra kathu, which means wave to Earth, little one. And what we are asking the little ones to imagine in this moment is that Somebody on Earth is waving back to them. Thank you, Junior Delegate. Um, so we, we do have a plan. We have an alternate definitional rubric, which we'd like to suggest tonight, which would redefine all of the planets, and it would add a... These are the only kind of slides you made, aren't they? Yes. Uh, I think that you should tell them the story about the old one. I think it is a good story, and I think our Earth friends would enjoy it very much. Is it, would it be possible to dim the lights on the stage, please? Could we please dim the lights on the stage? And perhaps some music from our Earth friend on the piano machine? Um, do you know carbon monoxide condensing in Charon's shadow? Or just something that's a little same chord progression. So, um, this is a story that we tell little ones. Story is the wrong word, and tell is the wrong word, but little ones is two words, and together they are correct. It won't be a surprise to any of you smart Earth friends, I'm sure. A long, long time from now. Long enough that Pluto and Neptune will have shaken hands many Shake thousands hands of is, millions is of times. It's a metaphor because we, we don't have hands, but we understand it to be a metaphor and we understand it to be appropriate. We'll have shaken hands many thousands of millions of times. The old one will exhaust its capacity for differential, and the old one will die. But it will grow before it goes. And in those final years, not many, but enough for Pluto and Neptune to shake hands many hundreds of thousands of times, Pluto will feel its warmth in a way that we never have before. Pluto will run with oceans and streams. Pluto will brim with the seaside sunny days, each of which will be as long as 6.5 of your seaside sunny days, Earth friends, and who knows what may come to be in that time. And then the old one will retire into itself, diminishing, and everything will become cool and cool and cooler until eventually there is no energy left in the system at all. 
these things will come to pass. Eventually, everything is one thing. We are two rocks orbiting a star. We are methane differential entities. You are essentially sacks of water. Home is home. And we love ours very much. Yours is a hard one to come into halfway, Earth friends, but we found much to love here as well. For example, pretzels and the music of Brian Eno. Our message, our message is that we do not see the sense in describing these two homes by separate names as if there were any difference at all. We are Delegation Pluto. Thank you very much for your attention. Good night. you guys feel similarly? Yeah. I feel like emotional journey and educational. Another round of applause for Delegation Pluto, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. We have reached the moment in the show where I'm going to read for you our, our final winner of our very short story competition. However, we had two that we loved equally, and so we thought we'd do a tie, right? Like, why not spread the joy around? If that works for all of you guys, does it? <laughs> Needy for approval, as always. All right, our final two winning tweets of the evening and our very short story competition. The first one is from Crick, no, Chris Mick, Chris MC, at Call Me C Mac. I think she's here tonight. I think she or he feels good, and he or she should. I am not. Hashtag bite-sized. I am small-boned, said the earthworm, with no hands on no hips to the robin. <laughs> Round of applause for Chris Mick at Call Me C Mac. It's also a very, I like the Twitter handle as well. Look at me. It's like I started off a little weird with the iPad, but now it's like, what is she, does she work at Twitter like that Andrew guy? Yes. I think they're gonna offer me a job. All right, I'm available, I'm not kidding. Okay, <laughs> and our final winner, tying with Chris Mick, a gentleman named Mark Blaine at Hurry Blaine Mark, which makes me think of Blaine from Waiting for Guffman. My idea to interfere with the live broadcast reached the CIA via at TW Fiction Fest, now in a holding cell interrogation. The bad cop is so sexy. <laughs> Round of applause, please, for Mark Blaine and all of our four winners tonight, and Cody on the piano for his additionally excellent contribution. I'm not going to put this down because I'm going to forget it. All right, you guys, we've reached a moment in the show that you've all been waiting for. The gentleman coming to the stage next has a name. You might have heard of it before. It is R.L. Stein. I know. He is, this is crazy information, what I'm about to read. He is one of the best-selling children's authors in history. His Goosebumps series inspired a television show that airs on The Hub and is available on Netflix and iTunes and... Let's all take in this next piece of information and has more than 350 million English language books in print. We should all be so lucky. His other stories include Fear Street, Mostly Ghostly, The Nightmare Room, and Rotten School. He's going he's gonna to give us two for the price of one, you guys. We get two performances from Mr. Stein, RL as I call him, but Mr. <laughs> Mr. Stein to you. He's going to tell a story he wrote specifically for Twitter and then is the bonus he's going to do a ghost story for us. Which is basically like Elvis coming back from the grave and singing Love Me Tender. That's what I feel is about to happen with R.L. Stein and his ghost story for us that he will do in collaboration with the live illustrationist, Michael Arthur. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for R.L. Stein. <laughs> Thank you very, back from the dead? What? What was that? I don't know, I tell you, this is why I'm especially glad to be here tonight. I did a book signing a couple weeks ago here in New York and a librarian came up to the table 
And she said, can I have my picture taken with you? The kids all think you're dead. <laughs> so it didn't quite make my, actually I'm having a really bad night. Uh, this woman stopped me. I was coming into the theater and a woman stopped me out in the lobby and she said, did anyone ever tell you you look a lot like R.L. Stein? No offense. She said, no offense. <laughs> Speak, Cody, Cody I, while I was sitting over there watching the others, somebody actually tweeted, the pianist looks a lot like R.L. Stein. Which is, that's my net. I don't know. That's my net. He's my nephew. He's just here. <laughs> yeah, Cody's. He's the talented one in the family. Really. I, every once in a while, I set like a challenge for myself and see if I can write a story live on Twitter and just sit down and, and start to write it. And this is one I did about a month ago. Um, I'm just going to read it. My wife Jane and I went to the Living Plankton exhibit at the Earth Sciences Museum downtown. A strange thing happened. The plants were in tall glass tanks filled with water. Some of the plants were thick as curtains and blocked the light. The pale green plants curled and pulsed inside the glass. Moving in the water, they certainly seemed alive. I stopped in front of a tank where a man appeared to be feeding the plants. As I came closer, I received a shock. It wasn't a man in the tank, it was a large glob of plankton, shaped like a man. Its arms and legs moved in the water. It appeared to stand upright. It had no bones. It was all leaf and tendril. It turned and I saw that it had a head the green pulsing head had no eyes, no nose, but as I stared through the glass, I saw it open, a wet green mouth, and it mouthed the words, help me. I froze in horror as it leaped from the tank, slimy, wet, it wrapped itself over me. The plant wrapped itself around me like a blanket over my head. It tried to smother me. I struggled, but it was too strong to push away. I saw the museum guard come running with a broom. He began to beat the plant creature with the broom handle. Smack, smack, smack. He beat the plant, furiously pounded the plant with the broom till it rolled off me. It curled into a loose ball and didn't move. The guard saved my life. At home that night, I found some sticky globs of green stuck to my shoes. I did my best to wipe them off, but later I saw patches of pale green sprouting on one ankle. I went to bed thinking it would come off in my morning shower, but I awoke with a thick green cover over my foot. It looks like I'm wearing a leafy sock, and it's sprouting on my other foot. My wife thinks I should go to the doctor, but I think it'll go away in a few days, don't you? <laughs> That's the story. Thank you. Since I write so many ghost stories, people always ask me, have you ever seen a ghost? And I'm not really sure if I have. I'm going to tell you a story that happened to my brother Bill and me back when we were kids. And it's a true story. And maybe you can decide if we saw a ghost or not. Bill and I grew up in a small community in Columbus, Ohio. And a couple blocks away from us, when we were kids, uh, lived our cousin Stanley. And we hated Stanley. We re hated him. He was a mean guy. My family was very poor. And Bill and I had to wear Stanley's old clothes to school. And Stanley was really terrible about it. He'd say, that shirt looked a lot better on me. Or, I wore those pants look great on me. You look like Bozo the Clown. And we hated that. We really, yeah, we hated it. And the other thing we hated about Stanley is that he was always trying to scare us. He would jump out of closets. He would hide under our beds. He would climb through a window. He would do anything to make us scream. And Bill and I had one dream 
one dream in life, and that was to scare Stanley. And one day, I figured out how to do it. It's sort of sad. There was a, an old man who lived two houses down from me. His name was Mr. Williams, and he died. He'd been sick for a long time, and he was very old, and he died. And a couple days later, I was walking to school in the morning, and I saw that Mr. Williams' front door was open. And I thought, oh no, somebody must have left his door open. So I went over to close the door for him and I walked up on his front stoop. And I thought, well, since I'm here, maybe I'll just take a look inside his house. I'll just look around for a few minutes. So I went into the house and it was, it was cold in there. The heat wasn't on. Um, and the only light, there was no light on, there was um, some morning red sunlight coming through the front window. And I looked around and everything was there. The furniture was still there. Everything was still in place. It was silent. And I looked into, I walked down the back hall and I looked in his bedroom and that's where I had the idea on how we were going to tell, scare Stanley. And I told it to my brother later that afternoon. I said, listen, Bill, you know Stanley's coming for dinner tomorrow night, and you know he's scared of ghosts, right? This is what we're going to do. You sneak over to Mr. Williams' house right after dinner, go into Mr. Williams' bedroom, climb under the covers, cover yourself up completely, and then I'm going to dare Stanley and say, I bet you won't go into a dead man's house. And of course, he will. And I'll bring him over to Mr. Williams' house, and I'll lead him into the bedroom. And when we get in there, you slowly, slowly sit up under the covers and say, get out of my house. <laughs> and we'll terrify him. I know this will work. And Bill said, this is a great idea. I love it. The only problem is I have a trombone lesson tomorrow. <laughs> My brother, he, he played trombone, he, but he had very short arms. He was short. He couldn't play any low notes. <laughs> he, could not, he could only play high notes. But he still carried the trombone around. I said, Bill, don't worry about it. I'll keep Stanley at the house really late, and I'll bring him over and give you plenty of time to get into Mr. Williams' bed. And this is exactly what we did. The next day, Stanley came for dinner, and we had a long dinner, and then we played some games or something. I kept him at the house after dinner, and then I said, Stanley, I'll bet you're too scared to go to a dead man's house. And he said, no way. No, I'm not. Are you kidding? Lead the way. So we went outside. I remember it was a cold October night. The ground was all crunchy hard from the frost. There was just a little sliver of a moon. Everything was all silver, very eerie. And I took him to Mr. Williams' house and we stepped into the dark living room and there's just that little bit of moonlight coming into the living room. I remember it so clearly. And I said, Stanley, I'll bet you're scared to go into a dead man's bedroom. And he said, no, I'm not. Come on, let's go. So I led him into Mr. Williams' bedroom, and we stepped in, and I could see my brother under. I could see the lump. I could see under the covers. And slowly he started to sit up. Slowly he started to sit up, and he yelled, get out of my house. And Stanley's eyes popped open. And his mouth dropped, and he let out a squeak. He couldn't even scream. He was so scared, he just squeaked. And he turned, he was terrified. And he ran out of the room and ran to the front of the house. And I thought, we did it, we did it, it was great. And he pushed open the front door and ran out to the street. And then I went to the front door and I could hear him screaming. I could see him all down the block, screaming his head off. We did it, I was so happy, and then, I saw my brother walking up the driveway, carrying his trombone case, and he said, am I too late to scare Stanley? 
<laughs> That's my true ghost story. Thank you very much. Thank you. I feel like it's October, do you? I'm talking to you, cutie in the corner. What? <laughs> Wouldn't it be a high pressure situation to be on stage in the way that our musicians are on stage? And because it's like you have to be thinking about what you're doing next, but at the same time, your face has to express like this is interesting. All our acts have been interesting and amazing. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but like you have to be so present whilst simultaneously thinking about your next move. Round of applause for Amy Jensen, ladies and gentlemen. Are you like the are you the the, the Cody Stein trio or what's the Yeah, are you go you're happy with that? What about you boys? Also happy with it. Oh my god, go yeah, and you're like fine, because you're happy and you're like in your tie. Um, here's what's crazy. What's crazy is a night in which R.L. Stein is not the closing act. That's crazy to me, but alas and alack, we have a gentleman who is going to follow him and who's going, who is going to do an excellent job of following him. His name is Christian Finnegan. You may have heard of him. Um, I knew Christian many years ago, like a decade, I think, was the last time I saw Christian, because since then I realized I wasn't particularly good at stand-up comedy, and he realized that he was amazing at it and good at being on TV, so he's like a superstar, and I spend some time at home and could work at Twitter, but anyway. Um... <laughs> Christian is a stand-up comedian and writer. You have seen him, I know I have, on Best Week Ever in the infamous Mad Real World sketch on Chappelle's show and like a million other shows. He is currently on the TBS sitcom, Are We There Yet? Are We There Yet? Are We There Yet? I can kind of sing, too. Um, while simultaneously working on his third stand-up comedy album, Not, with a K, enthusiast, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage your headliner, Christian Finnegan. <laughs> Sarah Barron, huh? I remember her from the open mic salt mines. So delightful to be here um, in the, what'd you call this, the East Village, I guess? It's the village, the coolest neighborhood in New York City, if this was 1997. It's... <laughs> It's still not bad. I, I, was, uh, I was actually in the, East, the real East Village last night. Here's a fun little game for those of you who live in New York or visiting New York. Uh, when you're in the East Village, go to St. Mark's Place between 2nd and 3rd Avenue on any Friday or Saturday night and try to identify one person you would save in a fire. <laughs> That's right. You heard me. One human being you would not allow to perish in flames. That is the challenge. I can't. I've tried. I'm like, no, you should die. And you should die. Oh, I'd start the fire that killed you. <laughs> would I save you? I was going to save you. And then you bought a fedora with the weed symbol on it. So I can't. You were so close. Uh, but it's lovely to be here in this uh, part of this Twitter event. Uh, I am a, a, a Twitter person, I guess. I mean, I guess you have to be. I'm in that weird sort of tweener stage. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, I'm not old enough that I can just be above Twitter, but I'm not young enough that I know it intuitively. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, I constantly feel like a dad trying to rap. That's where I'm at in my life. I do have one little fun game on Twitter I play. It's called Made You Google. And uh, that's where I, I, I post something that is just a flat out lie that will surely enrage people. And then about 30 seconds later, just tweet, made you Google. Do you know what I mean? That's like, like earlier today, I tweeted that South by Southwest was funded by the Koch brothers. And that, that, <laughs> it's most fun when you take something that people love and then really crap on it. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, oh, I can't believe they're doing a Matrix uh, reboot, but I think Zac Efron will make a great Neo. Do you know what I mean? Like then people are like, what? I <laughs> made you Google. <laughs> I think I told uh, people that Jared Leto was the new singer for the Arcade Fire. That was, that was a fun one. I am, uh, I am sort of older, though. I, I am 40 now. Thank you. I don't know why that 
I'm actually okay with it. I'm actually excited to be in my earlies again. Does that make sense? Like, I'm now at the beginning of something. You know, I'm really young for a guy in his 40s, as opposed to last year when I was desperately clinging to my 30s. Um, but I'm 40 years old, so my body is decaying rapidly. <laughs> but I am a comedian. Like, what you're watching right now is my job. Like, this is not like a... Like, I'm not like a heart surgeon by day, and this is what I do. For, this is not like a make-a-wish situation that I'm up here. This is my, my gig, what I do. So that means, I don't know if you realize, there's not a whole lot of adult skills that come into play with being a stand-up comedian. So I am like 50% 80-year-old man and 50% 6-year-old girl. Like, you should never find yourself where I'm at in my life right now, where you have to buy medicated back pads on a regular basis, but still have no idea how the stock market works. I have no clue. Over Christmas break, my cousin spent 20 minutes telling me how I needed to get a Roth IRA. She's like, you really got to invest in a Roth IRA. And the entire time, all I did was imagine David Lee Roth as an Irish terrorist. That's, that's, it's, 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 it's a fun time. Give Ireland back to the Irish, scoobity bop. Um, for you millennials, David Lee Roth was a singer in a rock and roll band. Rock and roll was a form of music popular in the 20th century. <laughs> Tears of a clown. Um, I am getting fatter by the hour. That's not fun. Uh, have I gotten fatter since I've been on stage? I think I have. Uh, I was fat, and then I got skinny, and now I'm getting fatter again. At this point, I've separated my wardrobe into two piles, with me and against me. Those are the two, and with me is having its ass handed to it on a regular basis. Awful. Like, I don't have to buy new clothing yet, but I am definitely pushing maximum capacity on this particular belt hole. <laughs> like, I don't know if you've ever gone through one of those phases where you're putting on weight and there's a little bit of drama every morning when you're like, I wonder if today is the day <laughs> that hole number three is no longer an option. <laughs> and when you're able to get the belt to the right hole, it's like, yes, I did it. Meanwhile, the hole is now this long. <laughs> Cause every day begins a little bend and stretch. Thank you, leather, most forgiving of materials. <laughs> Am I the only one here who decides what pants I'm gonna wear every day according to how long I have to sit down that afternoon? Is that, nobody else factors in that criteria? It's very important, right? You gotta think about it, like, all right, where am I going? Uh, going to a party, ooh. I'm gonna be standing all night. I can wear the tight-fitted pants. <laughs> what, we're going to the movies, what are we seeing? Wolf of Wall Street, that movie is 14 hours long. Bring forth the sweatpants. <laughs> it's weird that we call them sweatpants, but if you're wearing them, you probably don't sweat often enough. They should call them you desperately need to sweatpants. <laughs> Thank you for the applause. Uh, <laughs> it all counts. I do, I, I go to the gymnasium, as one must at a certain point in his life. I went to a personal trainer for a while, but it's just too manly, it's too alpha for me. You know what I mean? Like the guy was like always in my face. He's always like, come on man, bring it, bring it. It's like, dude, I don't even know if I have it. Like how about I look around and I bring whatever I find. How about you bring it and I borrow it for like an hour? Is that, would that work? Is there a sadder moment in anyone's life than when you take your gym clothes off after having spent all day not going to the gym? Does so anyway, <laughs> That's the saddest, right? That's the saddest thing you can possibly do. You know, you wake up, you're like, I'm going straight to the gym today. I'm waking up, going right to the gym. Just gotta read this one email that I'm gonna go to the gym. You know what? It's not healthy to go to the gym without having a little bite to eat first. Gotta have a little breakfast, and I'm going right to the gym. You know what, you gotta give your body time to recuperate after you eat, I'm gonna wait a little time, then I'm going, you know what, I need to respond to that email. And then all of a sudden it's 6.30 in the evening and you're like, this is not gonna happen. This is, uh, I am the worst person alive. Um, I have to start growing up, I guess. I, I am married, sorry fellas. Uh, <laughs> I know I give off a certain high school drama teacher vibe. Um, <laughs> And scene. Um, I'm 
a father as well. My wife and I, last year, we adopted a child from Central America. Thank you. That's, that's very sweet of you. I'm, I didn't say it to make it sound like I'm a better person than you are, but if that's what you take, that's fine. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what to think. Uh, we adopted a five-year-old boy from Honduras. It's going very well so far. Uh, $22 a month, childreninternational.com, which I, I don't know why you laughed at that. Oh, did you guys think I meant one of those like live in your house adoptions? <laughs> I do not like children in the flesh. No, this is, this is more of like a rent to own scenario. Um, fine, we're sponsoring a child. Let me tell you this, if you are considering sponsoring a child, I highly recommend you go with Children International, okay? Because you will not beat 22 bucks a month. That's as good as it gets. I was like, really? Christian Children's Fund, really? $26 a month, really? I saw the same kid for 22 at Children International. I don't know what kind of scam you're running, but this is nonsense. You know they make you pick the kid, right? You go to the website, there's hundreds of photos of children. God forbid you just donate money to be a humane person. It's like, no, 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 I want that kid right there. Don't give this kid any of my stuff, I want this kid. It's something about his face. I don't like his face. I got dibs on that one. It's not how it works. You should know this. When you give to a charity like that, you're not giving to an individual. You give to an organization, uh, and then they build hospitals and buy school supplies. It's not as if these kids show up on the first day of school, and they're like, all right, Eduardo, here's your pencil. Felipe, you should have smiled more. What can I tell you? You're not quite adorable enough um, to live. And... Um, Oh, how dare you moan at me, people? How dare you? I'm the one giving that kid money, not you, okay? A joke is bought and paid for like 50 times over. That doesn't somehow morally absolve you. Like, I don't sponsor a child, but a comedian once made a joke and I hissed, so I'm, ethically I'm covered. No, I don't want to bum people out. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my son. Uh, <laughs> He's got feet, I think. No, I, I, no I, I know a little because we're pen pals. That's part of the deal. I'm not just throwing money at this kid. We're, he sends me letters once a month. Can I be perfectly frank with you? These letters this kid sends me? Boring. <laughs> this kid's a dud. It's bringing nothing to the table. It's like, can I throw in two bucks a month for a creative writing course or something? You know, you gotta, gotta punch up this prose, kid. Maybe copy the elements of style or something? Come on, man. I like playing soccer with my friends. Oh, you're blowing my mind. Oh. <laughs> a kid from Central America who loves soccer. Who'd have thunk it? Oh. I don't know what to say to this kid. He doesn't watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> we don't have any kids, my wife and I, but uh, we did pool our money together uh, last year. Uh, she said she's sick of living in New York. She's like, I gotta get out of New York City. Which makes me so proud, because you're not a real New Yorker until you're pretty sure you'd be happier somewhere else. That's, that's when you know you're legit. Uh, but we pooled our savings together, and we bought a little uh, Unabomber shack up in the, the Catskills, about two and a half hours from here. Uh, which is nice for my wife, because she grew up in the woods, rural Texas. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs, so to me, the woods has always meant one thing and only one thing, murder. <laughs> right? We're city people, trees equal murder, right? Like when the realtor was showing us houses, she was like, hey guys, look down here. This house has crawl space. I'm like, oh, that's where the bodies go, right? That's where it's, what is crawl space other than a rotting corpse storage unit? It's just, um, it's where you house your decaying flesh. Um, but I, I'm used to it now. I like it. Uh, I'm kind of woodsy. I own a chainsaw. Don't know how to use it, but it is physically present in the house. Uh, do you guys know you can just go buy a chainsaw? Like, you don't need to show a therapist note or anything. They'll just give you a brutal torture device. I didn't even know you could cut trees with a chainsaw. I thought it was strictly for ripping through human flesh, but apparently it also works on branches, right? Which is nice. My friends who live in the city, they won't visit us because they're, they're nervous. Or like, well, what do you guys do when you go to the woods? Like, well, we have a fire pit. We sit outside. It's really nice. My friend's like, dude, that's like the first scene in every horror movie right there. <laughs> no, that's how we start. There's the couple, and they're in the woods, and they're in love, and then the murderer shows up. And I say, first of all, we're not that in love. Let's bring it down. <laughs> Let's 
been 11 years, let's be realistic here. More importantly, I am not scared because I am 40 years old. My wife is 42. We are way too old to be murdered in a horror movie. <laughs> Neither of us is young enough or sexy enough to be targeted by a dude wearing a hockey mask. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're aged out of danger, if that, if that makes any sense. Like, just, just out of curiosity, you don't want me, I don't want to, how old are you if you don't want me asking? 26, dead, dead. <laughs> she will die. She can't go to the woods. She, you can, she can't risk it. She, you'll, you'll be in your underwear like, Kevin, you'll be dead <laughs> immediately. The only thing she has in her favor, she is brunette. Sometimes brunettes will survive. Blondes always die. Blonde, blonde women and black dudes cannot survive in the woods. I'm sorry. I didn't make the rules. That's just the way it is. Especially not together. No. <laughs> Me, white dude, 40 years old, totally safe. You will never see a horror movie about a dude who goes around killing 40-year-olds. Be the worst movie of all time. Just some weirdo creeping through the woods with a bloody axe. And he looks in a window. He sees my wife and I arguing over our Netflix queue. <laughs> we were on Breaking Bad season three, not season four. You watched those episodes without me, didn't you? This is why we don't have sex anymore. <laughs> and the murderer be like, I'm gonna leave you guys alone. You guys are kind of freaking me out. I saw some frat boys down the road. I think I'll go murder them. People, you've been a, a pure delight, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Unbelievable that my strapless bra stayed up through all that. But that 38A is tight, bitches. All right, listen, it's like the end of the Oscars. It's time for all of us to go home. However, before we do, we need some expressions of gratitude. First and foremost, we need to thank our organizers this evening. I need a big round of applause and maybe some gratitude music to underscore no pressure. Gratitude, gratitude music, like, thank you, music. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Twitter. Penguin, <laughs> I'm gonna... Random House and the American Association of Publishers. Thank you to our sponsors too. USA Today, Dark Horse Wine, Six Point Brewery, coming out. My name is Sarah Barron. I wrote a book. It's called The Harm and Asking. Buy it so I can afford Obamacare. Good night. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>